Omar Abedli is Director of Research, Bahrain Center for Strategic Studies, International and Energy Studies. As you're the one in the middle of it all, literally and metaphorically, uh, where do we go from here? Are we closer to a regional ceasefire or a regional war? So I think that the way in which the different parties have behaved recently suggests that nominally we're closer to a regional ceasefire in the sense that all sides have indicated they don't want a significant escalation. However, the problem is that there are many wars in history that have started accidentally because if you put enough uh, you know, troops on borders, if you trip, uh, then some a missile is gonna accidentally arrive in the wrong place, it's gonna kill a lot of people, and then there'll be pressure to retaliate and so on and so forth. And even today, I believe there's been more skirmishes, continuing skirmishes on the Lebanese-Israeli border, uh, and Israel is still unable to uh, achieve its stated goals in Gaza, and is still encountering military resistance in Gaza. Uh, so, and then obviously we still have the continuing uh, escalations uh, uh, and interruptions to trade around the Straits of Hormuz and Bab al-Mandeb. So in the grand scheme of things, I'm afraid we, we're at, we are significantly closer to a regional war just because with this many military pieces um, clo that close to each other uh, and a lack of dialogue between the, uh, you know, the relevant parties. And now, as you probably saw in the newspapers, Qatar is being, you know, uh, uh, castigated as a mediator which creates you know which gets rid of another potential you know avenue of de-escalation so uh, uh in answer to your question i think uh, nominally we're closer to regional peace but fundamentally we're closer to a regional war i'm thinking about the you know what's at stake here as the israeli government consider their next move in this fairly tumultuous chess game, if you like, uh, with dire consequences, obviously. But ultimately, uh, the, you know, where is the consideration? I mean, going back again, sort of this idea of pre-October 7th, pre-October in this equation, uh, the halcyon days in which the, you know, Saudi and Iran had rapprochement, uh, the Israelis and the Saudis and the Americans seemed to be doing some kind of a deal together. And I'm, and we obviously had the Abraham Accords in the recent years. Um I'm wondering where they come into consideration. Clearly, if the Israeli government re re uh, re retaliates against Iran, most analysis would be that uh, in your earlier comments puts us closer to a regional war, which we've obviously been trying to avoid uh, uh, for some months now. But my question ultimately is, how much is in the thinking for Israel, the relationships that it has built up in the Middle East in recent years and was pre-October 7th looking like moving further uh, in their direction? How much is that at stake, do you think, in their consideration? Should it be, where do you see all of that in its uh, in the influence of direction of travel? So I think it's important to draw a distinction between what this Israeli government collectively and, and society collectively seeks and what Netanyahu and his clique are, are seeking. Uh, let's take the first part, which is what Israeli society and the government is thinking. They have a, a, a moment, what appears to be an intractable, intractable problem, which is that the settlements around Gaza uh, and the settlements around southern Lebanon are still not resettled. You know, the, the people who live there, the Israelis who live there, are still living to a significant degree in hotels and, and unable to resume their normal lives. And so they have a proximate problem which dominates the kind of, uh, or, or supersedes the issues you discussed, which is how do we get these people, how do we create a condition where these people can uh, uh, go back to their homes? And, at the, and, and in terms of the, you know, regional uh, dialogues, the problem for Israel is that a precondition for the, for countries like Saudi Arabia and the other ones that are under consideration, seemingly a precondition for the kind of dialogues you're describing are uh, 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 issues that are uh, in, in, incompatible with the return of these Israelis to those settlements. So at the moment, Israel is putting those things on the back burner and focusing on some sort of military conquest or, or, or victory that will allow those people to go back and then it can go back to the bargaining table, potentially with a stronger hand. That's how it perceives it. 
But in the mean, in, in the middle of all that, you have Netanyahu, who is, you know, uh, uh, you know, has been described as the sort of Teflon politician, uh, trying uh, for the umpteenth time to cling to power using any means uh, uh, available. And in this regard- Upteen times, he's been in power for 30 years on and off. But I mean, yes. this guy is more than, I mean, it's, it, I, I think it's we have to be cautious too in the uh, in the analysis that, that you know, Netanyahu is not Israel and Israel is not Netanyahu. They've elected him for 30 years. I mean, let's wake up and smell the coffee here. They yes, like the guy. I think there is, I think there was, it's very clear that there was a lot of political unrest, domestic political unrest, in the last five years in in in, uh, in Israel, uh, surrounding Netanyahu and the alternatives, culminating in in very extended periods of protests prior to October seventh, and even continuing now, although they don't get seem to get much media attention. So yes, I agree that Netanyahu may be the closest thing to the preferable politician, the preferred politician of Israeli society. But at the moment, nobody can claim in Israel to be, you know, being particularly, to having particularly strong mandate, Netanyahu or otherwise. And that's very clear from the domestic political scene. So his, um, uh, and, and his machinations or his uh, steadfast uh, refusal to relinquish power and his willingness to undertake uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, radical uh, and escalatory actions in order to maintain power is affecting this dynamic. Uh, and so that's how would you why... think how the reason I'm sort of triggered into this question to you, obviously your regional expertise, but briefly on the back of this joint statement yesterday by Saudi Arabia and the UAE calling for, uh, you know, regional calm, if you like, basically reminding the Israelis what's at stake here if they cross this line. Your interpretation of that statement yesterday. So, I mean, look, any regional conflict, the biggest losers are the Gulf countries um, at, the, at the sort of geostrategic level. Obviously, the people who, who die are, are the most directly affected. But if there's at the geostrategic level, any regional conflict, the Gulf countries. So Saudi Arabia and, and UAE, with that statement, do two things. First of all, is that there's a there's there's the carrot of remember if you can de-escalate, you can be friends with us, and there's lots of money on the table. Uh, don't forget this. Um, and I think there's also partially a carrot in the, a stick partially in there. Obviously, the Saudi Arabian UAE don't have strong ability to influence uh, to to sort of hold Israel accountable, but they do have influence over America. And when you marry what the UAE and Saudi Arabia is saying with the pretty strong statements from the U.S. regarding that it's not going to be part of any retaliatory effort uh, and the election hanging over everyone's heads in the U.S. I think uh, it's it's part of the messaging uh, and telling both Israeli society and Netanyahu at the same time. Let's pipe this down. Let's remember that there's uh, everybody can be very rich if everybody can learn to coexist. Omar. Um... Given where this oil market's been at, and we've talked about it for some time now, that uh, the the stakeholders uh, to the market, whether they be fund managers or physical traders and so forth, are not going to uh, sort of advance this oil price in any significant uh, way in terms of geopolitical risk until supply actually gets disrupted rather than the possibility of it being disrupted, uh, which is where we've been at for some time, because, of course, none of it has. Uh, are we at a different point now if we go down the likelihood of regional conflict? I mean, we've had regional conflicts in the past here, and, and clearly, uh, uh, you know, both disruptions have happened and disruptions haven't happened. Is this one where we're, we're not quite betting in the what's at stake here or could we have a conflict an escalation at least uh next step being an escalation where again supply is not disrupted no i think that the the, the risk of supply disruptions is actually very large uh because of bab al and the straits of homeless if iran wants to and its you know, proxies and allies and partners want to exert considerable pressure on external parties and internal parties in the region, then the give me is to escalate and bubble and demonstrates of wrongness. There's nothing Israel can do about that. The US is already pretty close to being maxed out in, in, in both areas. Uh, and you saw with the you know Iran uh, symbolic, but that's certainly indicative uh, boarding of a vessel, I believe it was last week, uh, uh, an Israeli affiliated, I think it's quite hazy, 
Uh, but I mean, and, and that was a very low tech operation and scaling that is trivial. Uh, so the option is there. Iran has made that, has signaled that the existence of that option very clearly to all different parties. Really, I think the only the, the, the wild card here is how China would respond, because obviously China wouldn't be happy about this, uh, such kind of such that kind of escalation. But by the same token, I think uh, China would be sympathetic to uh, Iran, you know, being angry about its consulate being struck uh, and, and other such acts of aggression. And the pressure would be turned back on towards Israel and its uh, Western backers. So really, I think uh, what we've seen, the, the lesson from the regional conflict is that we've seen thus far is that the um, uh, it can happen without threats to oil supplies, which is why the uh, oil supply, the premium hasn't risen so far, but at any point, Iran and its partners have the option of making a major disruption to oil supply routes, which would then lead to a rocketing of the price uh, at a moment's notice.